How's, uh, how's everyone doing? Awesome, awesome. So think global, a guide to high-performing global dev teams. But before we start, first things first, we got to thank our sponsors. Uh, without these guys, this event would have not been possible. So thank you, sponsors, for putting up such a great show. And thank you, organizers, for putting up this show so all of you can come here and have a culture of learning. Awesome, thank you. All right, so let me start off with a story. Uh, this story happened to me at work. I need you to meet two of my colleagues. First colleague is Raj. Raj works in our India office, uh, specifically in Bangalore. And then this is Jason. Jason. Jason works in the office in Overland Park, Kansas. But they both work for the same team. So that's Jason. <laughs> so these guys would have daily scrum at 9 in the morning. And since Raj is the only person, uh, or one of the only people from the India office, he would call in to the meeting at 9 in the morning central time. So that's Raj calling in, right? But after a while, Raj decides to come over to, uh, to the US. So he gets on a plane and says, all right, I'm going to go meet my colleagues and, and have a lot of fun with them. And he was welcomed. He was shown around Kansas City. They had a great time. It was one day, uh, let's call it a random Wednesday, 9 in the morning, time for your daily scrum. Everyone gets up and walks towards the scrum area. And Raj gets up with the whole team, and he also walks towards the scrum area. That's when Jason spotted him. And Jason goes to him and says, hey, where are you going? You've always called into this meeting. It's going to feel really strange if you don't call in. <laughs> and Raj gets really puzzled. He's like, oh, what? OK, fine. And he goes back to his desk and starts calling in to the meeting. <laughs> and I witnessed all of this. And I go back to Raj and say, hey, man, like, why aren't you calling in? Why are you call calling in? He's like, yeah, because Jason asked me to. I'm like, no, no, he was joking. So this was a clear misunderstanding of what I think of a global a cultural context. Jason wasn't aware of Raj's cultural context. So Jason's still waiting in the scrum area waiting for Raj. <laughs> and Raj wasn't aware of Jason's cultural context. Who am I? My name is Avindra Fernando. I'm a senior software engineer focusing on front-end development. Uh, lately, uh, at RSA, at my company, I've been focusing on some of the DevOps transformation efforts that we're going through. So that's, uh, you guys can follow me on Medium and Twitter. Let me share you guys another story. This is my story. 12 years ago, I came to the United States from a little island country called Sri Lanka. It's the other part of the world. So I got on a plane and got here, landed in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, where I went to school at. So any Jayhawks in the audience? <laughs> Woo! Nice, nice. So these were my first friends. Um, I'm not really sure where they are now, uh, but that's a photo from the dorm, and that's me. So on campus, we walk on the sidewalks, and I see a lot of people, and I notice something strange to me. A lot of the people, when I'm walking, they say, hey, how's it going? And to me, that didn't, that was, and I noticed that they, they kept walking. I'm like, you asked me a question, but you don't want my answer, <laughs> right? This, so I spoke to my international colleagues, and all of them, most of them said, yeah, this happened to us. But that's when I realized in the US, hey, how's it going? It's just a form of greeting, right? It's just smiling at someone. You're not expecting them to tell their life story to you. So another example of a cultural misunderstanding that I went through. How about this one? Have you guys seen this email or this type of email where you ask for something and then you get th back the response? And then that guy right there. I see this quite often. And I was puzzled. I was like, what does that mean? I requested the change. So why are you asking me to revert it? And then I kept seeing it over and over in emails. And then I figured it out. I figured it out. Please revert meant, please reply. 
another example of a cultural misunderstanding. So in his talk, Ricardo Fernandez, Managing Global Teams, he talks about an interaction that he had with a colleague from South Africa. So Ricardo gets on IM, and he was IMing his South African colleague, and says, um, hey, we need to discuss this further. And the South African colleague says, all right, let me call you just now. So Ricardo goes back to his office, waits by the phone, expecting a call. Five minutes pass by, 10 minutes pass by, 15 minutes pass by, and still no call. So he gets a little frustrated and calls the colleague in South Africa and says, hey, what's going on? You were going to call me just now, right? And the South African colleague responds and says, yeah, I was going to call you just now. But that's when Ricardo realized the concept of South African time. <laughs> in South African time, when you have a, a linear scale, present time and future, you got to know the difference between right now, 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 and then just now. <laughs> so just now means sometime in the future, or it may not even happen, right? <laughs> so another misunderstanding due to the lack of cultural awareness. So we live in a world where we have the globe at our hands thanks to the internet. So global business is very critical for a company's success because you get perspectives from different individuals all across the world. Those are the people who know those markets really well. So if you're trying to go to business in another country, you may very well consult people from that country because they can tell you exactly how it works. But we come with the challenge of managing these global teams. Managing a team which is co-located here, even in the US, is challenging. Now think about how do we manage a team when it's global, when everyone speaks a different language, when everyone is located all across the world. It gets pretty challenging. So um, Aaron Meyer, Professor Aaron Meyer wrote a book called The Culture Map, which is an excellent read. She talks about a lot of these how do we identify some of these differences, and how do we reconcile uh, these differences? So there's an interesting scale or set of scales that she presents. So the first scale is a communication scale. The communication scale has two ends. One of them is low context communication and high context communication. So low context communication is very direct and explicit communication. You mean what you say, and you say what you mean. High context communication cultures, it's all about reading the air. It's all about reading what, what's between the lines. It's all about reading your body language. And that's how effective communication is done. So the US is an example of a low context communication culture, whereas Japan would be an example of a very high context communication culture. And the other cultures will fall in between somewhere in the scale. The next scale is evaluating direct negative feedback versus indirect negative feedback. The US falls in a very interesting uh, position in that scale, uh, but there are cultures who are, it's about giving direct negative feedback, and then some cultures give indirect negative feedback. The next scale is leading. Are you more of an egalitarian type of society, or is it hierarchical? You have very strictly defined hierarchies that, that you go through. Next scale is deciding. When you come to your decision, is it based on the consensus? Or are you expecting decisions to be from the top down? Trusting scale. This one's very interesting. The trusting scale talks about if you are trying to go to business with someone, do you have to trust them at a personal level? In some cultures, that's very critical. You got to know them really well, uh, even at a personal level, before you decide to go to business with them. Uh, in the US, I think the trusting scale is more on task-based, right? I, I've seen your track record. I've, I know how you conduct business, and that's good enough for me to go to business with you. 
disagreeing? Do you encourage uh, direct disagreement, or is it, do you try to avoid confrontation? So these are the two ends of, of that scale. Scheduling scale, the concept of time. Is it more rigid? And then we say we're going to meet at 11 a.m., and we will meet at 11 a.m., or is it more flexible? Is it organically more flexible? So one of the examples about scheduling would be Japan. Uh, the, the time is very rigid. So if a train comes even one minute late, uh, Japanese would apologize to the public, saying, hey, we're sorry that the train is a minute late. Last one is persuading. Persuading is um, basically, do you do applications first, or do you do the principles first? So the applications first is, if you're trying to persuade a group of people about a concept, do you show that examples of how it's been done at other places, so more like case studies type of things, and then go to the principles, or do you talk about the principles first, fully understand the concept, and then talk about, okay, how did my competitor, or how did this company adopt this concept? So these are some scales that Erin Meyer talks about in her book, The Culture Map, that we can use to mitigate some of the global communication challenges that we face today. So a reader asked Erin Meyer, hey, is stereotyping cultures in this manner useful? Isn't every individual different? And the answer to that is, yes, every individual is different. But we cannot uh, deny that there are some cultural differences. I think there are some cultural differences even within the US. If you consider someone from the West Coast, from the Midwest, to the Far East, then the South, you, sh you should have certain cultural differences. So the key is to understand those differences first, and then you can focus on the individual differences. So think of this as a bell curve. If you survey a group of people who are co-located in a certain geographical region, and you ask a set of questions, and when you get, gather the responses, most responses will fall in, in the middle of the bell curve. But you will also have individual difference, individuals who differ from the collective opinion. So let's look at the communicating scale a little bit more. So low context communication and high context communication. Uh, the US is one of the most low com context communication cultures in the world. And there's a reason for this. The reason is the US is a fairly new country when you consider a lot of the other countries in the world. So when the European settlers moved to the United States, they were all speaking different languages. They were all coming from different geographical regions. So they had no choice but to communicate directly and explicitly in order for you to progress as a society. So that's the reason why we see the US in the far left of the low context style of communication. On the other hand, we see uh, some Asian cultures who fall in the high context style of, style of communication uh, where it's about reading there. It's about what was not said. So you have to master reading body language uh, to really figure out what the communication style is and to get a message across uh, directly. Another example is, this one's interesting. So although the US does direct, explicit communication, when it comes to negative feedback, the US really falls right in the middle. Because it's about the concept of you have to give three positives before you discuss constructive criticism. So that, that was uh, pretty interesting for the perspective of the US, given that the US is the most low context communication culture uh, in the world. So what, what are some things that we can do to, to overcome some of these challenges? Uh, I would start with the three R's. The three R's are basically recognize the first step is recognize that there are something called cultural differences. So you can increase your awareness uh, and increase your empathy 
to recognize some of these differences when you're trying to conduct business with a person from a different culture. The next thing is to know to respect those differences. It's fine to have differences, but the key is to respect the other person's point of views. Try to put yourself in their shoes and try to understand where they're coming from, from that perspective. And that will really lighten up uh, a lot of, the, lot of the issues that we're facing today. And lastly, just recognizing and respecting is not enough to make progress. We have to reconcile those differences. We have to be more empathetic to those differences so we can make progress in uh, a professional setting. So I'm going to share with you guys some examples that I've tried or I've gone through in my career. So the first one is using video conferencing. Body language is very important when it comes to communication. We know about 55% of communication is through body language. You know when someone's angry. You know when someone's really happy. You know when someone's sad. But when you're working with global colleagues, when you're working with remote colleagues, you don't really get to see them. And without seeing them, you lose a lot of that context. And when you're trying to get it, your message across to someone else. So my recommendation is to use video conferencing as much as you can. And this could be challenging at first. Uh, if your team is not already using video conferencing, uh, getting everyone to buy into the idea of being on video uh, would be a challenge at first. But I think once you overcome that, uh, it'll solve a lot of the communication challenges that we're facing uh, in, at the global level. So yeah. We, everyone should get a chance to speak in these meetings. So we had an example where one of our colleagues, and we, we were doing audio conferencing in the beginning. Uh, that colleague would wait until the meeting's over, and she would tell me personally, hey, I really wanted to share some ideas, but I never got the chance. I never got the chance to speak up. So then I would ask her, why, why didn't you? And it's like, I, could, I never knew when to speak. I didn't know when the people on the phone were going to stop speaking, so it was my chance. So the recommendation here is if you're the leader running the meeting, or if you're someone who's assuming the position of the leader for that meeting, then make sure, encourage all the team members and, and make sure that they get a chance to have their voices heard. Uh, because everyone's opinion is valuable, and it's going to drive a lot of the discussion if everyone who's in the meeting can contribute to that meeting. Learn from one another. This is a great experience. The global experience is great. So leverage your friends. Leverage your international friends to learn more about their cultures. So I've done that. Being from Sri Lanka, I'm actually married to my best friend, uh, she's from India. The two countries are very closely located, but she's helped me understand, yeah, there are a lot of similarities, but there are some differences. So we were able to reconcile those differences and make progress. So I leveraged my best friend, right? Just like that, you all should leverage your international friends to understand the culture a little bit of where they're coming from. So that way, in the future, if you meet someone from the same country, or the same geographical region that you're not aware of some of the cultural elements that that individual is bringing to the table. Another thing that as developers that we can do is to do global code reviews. I strongly encourage doing a global code review because not only you get the feedback on the technical content, but you really see how people give and receive feedback when they're from different cultures how people persuade each other to implement ideas, and how people make technical decisions at the global level. So I encourage you guys to do cross-cultural code reviews uh, as developers. I think it'll be, it'll be really helpful. The next one is be empathetic. So sympathy is when you, can, when you, when you know someone's going through something, and you kind of feel pity for them. 
But empathy is when you really feel what they feel. So if you put yourself in their shoes, that's empathy. That's, that's when you truly know the pain of what someone else is going through. So we're at a DevOps conference, so the devs should try to put their shoes in the ops people's shoes so they can feel the pain of what the ops people feel. And the ops people should do the same to understand the pain of what the developers are going through. So be empathetic. So we have these conversations which happen over the water cooler, right? They happen for a reason. They, ha they encourage a lot of small talk and, and build great relationships over the water cooler type of conversations. But when you're working with people from a global environment, you don't, you don't really get to see them or you don't get to meet them. So what you can do is when you have a meeting, ensure the first five minutes of the meeting, just, just make it casual. Just have everyone get to know each other before you actually start the contents of the meeting. Lastly, if you can afford it, meet in person. This goes a long way. I've been fortunate enough to work for companies uh, which encourage this a lot. I've seen a lot of colleagues from the US go over to other countries where we have offices and then meet the colleagues in person and build great relationships. Similarly, I've seen the colleagues from outside the US came over to the US offices and met a lot of our colleagues here and had a, had a lot of fun. So I encourage meet in person as much as you can if you can afford it. The next thing you can do is, let's say that there's a conference in London, and then you have a team in the US, you have a team in, in Japan, you have a team in Europe. All of these individuals can get together in London for that conference. That's a great team building exercise that you can do at the global level. So I ask you guys a question. Typically, the audience would ask me the question. I ask you guys a question, what's your story? What are some things that you've tried in your life, in your professional setting, to overcome some of these challenges? I would love to hear about it. Uh, so catch me at lunch, catch me after lunch. And I really want to hear about your perspectives, your stories on how you guys handle this scenario. So we live in a world where global communication is critical for the successes of our businesses. It is important to get to know the perspectives of the international individuals so we can drive business globally and be successful and be competitive in the respective industries that we're in. Thank you. <laughs>